So um, my name is Florin Manaila. I'm a senior architect uh, within IBM Community Systems um, uh, across Europe. I'm dealing for the last five years mostly with uh, distributed deep learning um, and with um, customers that are trying to uh, infuse uh, deep learning and machine learning in existing HPC systems. So um, during today's presentation, I'll try to um, uh, show you the IBM uh, strategy of uh, infusing AI in uh, those uh, high-performance computing systems, and as well share with you some of my experience on my latest projects, um, project at MIT in US um, called Satori, is the number four in green 500 uh, and number one greenest uh, air cool system in the world. So um, let's let's move here on the next slide. Okay. Um, if we are looking right now to the um, uh, what's happening into the R and D, uh, you see on the left side typically those simulations are run opportunistic. So people they try to identify the best parameters for their simulations and the best data for that. And they are running those simulations for hours, days, and weeks. And then uh, they are getting their experiments. So this is a normal process um, as of today. And this is a very consuming um, process, time consuming process, mostly from the perspective of the fact that you need to understand what parameters you're going to use. You, understand, you need to understand where you're going to uh, look, uh, what kind of data you're going to incorporate in your experiments. Um, and many of the researchers, they are looking for something like an advisor, someone that can you know, say, well, maybe you should pick up those ingredients or those compounds in your simulations to find out the best, uh, uh, the, the best uh, simulation or to get the, on, to much faster to uh, creating your own product. Um, and therefore, um, using machine learning and deep learning um, for um, compressive discovery by cognitive, uh, uh, um, let's say, solutions will be uh, the upcoming default factor when we are trying to, let's say, scatter the data and recommend what kind of data should be included into a simulation um, and then try to recommend uh, by even using uh, Bayesian optimization um, what are the best parameters for the simulations um, and then to come up with new products and run those experiments. And therefore the time needed for coming up with a new product or new ideas uh, will be, let's say, compressed. And we have to understand that this is not only because this is something that, well, it's, it's fashion or something that is modern right now, it's because the data that we have available, it's so much right now, and it's really hard for any, uh, any data scientist, anyone which is doing so many simulations uh, in the field, either if he's doing completely free dynamics um, or either is doing, for example, chemistry, how you choose the best uh, algorithms, uh, the best um, um, uh, parameters for your models, the best data for your models. This is a big challenge right now. And therefore, we're trying to understand how we can use machine learning and deep learning to help us uh, doing those kind of recommendations or shorting down this, uh, this time to uh, coming up with new products. Um, here's an example of the knowledge discovery, uh, discovery pipeline where we have the ingest uh, structure and unstructured data to create those massive knowledge spaces. And uh, typically, um, this is where this is domain specific. Um, so you can have somewhere which is studying, for example, quantum chemistry. Uh, they have many, many sources of the data. So the first thing is, you know, to have this knowledge space where we can have then an algorithm looking for similarities or for novel uh, issues or problems, and then they can, you know, indicate, well, you should try those uh, parameters or we should not try those parameters because someone else has tried them already and they're not that good. Um, and then another thing is how you can enable those uh, contextual based search based on the meaning on keywords that the data scientists, um, they, they really want to, um, uh, to do the, their experiments. 
And at the end is, you know, you really have to understand that you need to have like an inference engine with those machine learning and deep learning models that will work for you. And if you try to put that into a perspective, uh, into a high performance computing cluster, you really need to tie them all those uh, pieces together. Um, so to have the inference, uh, assuming you have done as well the training for that, working with, uh, with applications from high performance computing uh, for indicating you the right uh, simulation that you should run. Um, so from that perspective, so far we had um, um, two kind of demands in, on the infrastructure side. We had um, uh, training and high performance computing. Typically the same systems are used for high performance computing and simulations and for training those uh, deep neural networks, uh, which are typically using equipment with uh, huge volumes of data, huge data sets in the range of uh, hundreds of gigabytes uh, to uh, terabytes. Uh, we need to have a lot of I.O. for and, and uh, high bandwidth for two reasons. First of all, because we typically tend to use uh, raw data, so we need to process that, which is I.O. intensive. And second is because then when you go and use GPUs like V100, 32 gigabytes uh, Voltas, or even in the future upcoming uh, Volta Next, the question is, you know, can you really feed those GPUs fast uh, from the data perspective? And therefore, the I.O., which is has to happen on the server, uh, on the storage as well, has to really um, uh, be focused for the high bandwidth and obviously low latency to increase the GPU utilization. And then is the scalability, right? So how we scale. We know MPI, we know uh, all these techniques in HPC, we reuse them for a training. But when you move to the inference side, when you have train your model to identify the compounds that you need for a specific thing, the question is, you know, how you package that inference? How you, uh, where you put that on what kind of accelerators uh, the question are coming, you know, what will be the cost per watt or cost per performance for this kind of inferences, um, processes that we're going to run. And therefore, advanced I.O. for minimal latency is actually the key word um, for decent scalability or elastic scaling. So what you, we need to have a solution where you need to add more uh, models provision on more GPUs to scale up with your uh, requests per second, which is are make are make maybe maybe they can come from uh, simulations uh, or they may come from users trying to find the best um, uh, the best parameters for the simulations. Uh, one of the question was um, even for us was the next generation of infrastructure stack. Um, hardware and, and software to support this fusion of AI inside. And to really understand uh, what we need, we have to really understand this AI workflow, um, where typically people that are taking data from various data sources, they are preparing this data, uh, split them for training, testing, and validation as well. And this is taking a lot of time and then they do training. Um, so the training can coexist very clearly in the same hardware infrastructure with simulations. Yeah, the workload manager either use uh, Slurm, either use LSF um, from IBM. The, 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 they are working the same. Uh, the pattern, the IO pattern is a little bit different. But in general, this kind of uh, training will require either batch training or either online training where people, they just fire up their Jupyter notebooks and they, they want to have that kind of interactive thing, which is something kind of new in HPC clusters right now. Um, so one of the questions, how you deal with that kind of thing. And if you have finished your, let's say, uh, training, you have find the best hyperparameters, um, you know, by using various techniques there, you need, you have that model that you train it. Um, and then you actually want to put that uh, for inference and then to consume that. Um, and therefore the question is how you can really adapt that because we know that the inference is actually online uh, while the, which is like, an, like a service that you serve always, while the whole HPC systems, majority of them, they are oriented to the batch AI, right? So to the batch processes. Um, and one of the key uh, questions is you know how we can incorporate uh, this inference process in a, in a simple manner, how we can expose some APIs so they will be 
very easy to uh, be integrated with an existing um, HPC applications. Um, another thing that we need to take care is you know, how we distribute the deep learning on, on such systems. So as long as you are running TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, uh, any kind of machine learning algorithm like XGBoost and so on, on a single accelerator, that's pretty simple. You can request the GPU in an interactive mode, a system interactive mode with a couple of GPUs, and you are running for a couple of hours. You can do the same for the batch process, but when it's about paralyzing your data or paralyzing your model across multiple accelerators, across multiple systems with those accelerators, the things are becoming a little bit more complicated. Because as long as you are having more complex models, then they will tend to scale more, and then they will challenge more your uh, IO infrastructure, storage distribution, uh, if you really want to keep up with a higher GPU utilization and we lower um, uh, CO2 e emissions, so carbon um, footprint, you need to have a carbon footprint is small from that perspective. Um, and even you may find use cases where the data sets are really quite small, but the models that they're running are very complex in training, and therefore they're really challenging the whole infrastructure from the, from the network stack, uh, storage stack, and, and system um, as well. Again, um, this is not about how you distribute your model. This is about as well how you're going to parallelize your data across multiple systems. And, and therefore, one of the key things is uh, here, uh, do we have something that can really understand uh, the topology, can really understand the number of accelerators we have, the type of the accelerator memory we use, and the number of systems and how those systems are interconnected. Them. So we need kind of you know, library that knows exactly this topology to distribute the data across the system. Um, and that's very important for a user perspective because as a data scientist really want to hook into a system, uh, you may consume some templates for batch or for online, but then you just want to run with your existing experience. As long as you are using Centric, you really have to take care on this. So uh, one of the things was how we can re-architect the hardware for AI, uh, starting from HPC uh, systems. So if you look on this uh, uh, drawing here, you have a typical architecture overview for a bare metal or Kubernetes-based uh, HPC system, where you have those compute nodes uh, with accelerators in various pods. You have logging nodes, service nodes, utility nodes serving the, the, the purpose of managing the system, updating, uh, exposing some services, and the infrastructure required to manage the infinite band, uh, the UFM nodes. And then you have the storage infrastructure, and you can run some as well additional servers for exposing or integrating with cloud object storage in the cloud or with other kind of uh, solutions. So that's something that typically we, uh, we see and we have built so far um, uh, uh, like this. But when you are trying to really put as well the AI in perspective, you have to think as well for inference because you need to consume that. You don't only want to train. And typically probably have seen that you, you, you may train 100 uh, neural networks for various cases, but very, very few that really come up with, uh, on the production, so on an inference side. Um, and really, when you want to infuse those processes uh, as inference, as scoring uh, into the, the, the existing workflow for simulations, you really need to have some dedicated compute nodes for inference uh, with uh, dedicated accelerators. Other there are FPGAs like U50, U200, other are GPUs like NVIDIA T4 right now, or specialized ASICs like you know Habana Goya, for example. So all this kind of thing right now is really changing the perspective, not only because I have a new system which is dedicated for inference, but I need to manage it. I need to keep up with that kind of, uh, uh, kind of stack. And one of the key questions was for us, you know, if you look uh, on the right side, you have the, the typical paradigm for HPC and even for, um, for deep learning where you have the CPU with large low uh, latency on the uh, on left side, and then on the right side, you have the accelerator with a small and high bandwidth memory. And it was like, you know, how we can actually hook this together and re-architect the system from the ground 
to really fast connecting them, right? Because the workloads are really either a GPU memory bound or are there a host memory bound. It really depends on the type of application, type of neural network, and so on, so on. So starting from this, we have um, um, a news uh, announced two years ago, the um, IBM Power uh, AC922 here in the middle for training and for high performance computing. Uh, using the NVIDIA V100 uh, GPUs, SMX2 form factor um, from two, four or six uh, GPUs per system. And this year, I think uh, two months ago, we announced the uh, AC922 um, that we uh, you see here for inference and for the data as well. Uh, a system which is currently supporting the NVIDIA T4 GPUs, um, and uh, upcoming FPGAs and ASICs are, are, are on the roadmap. And we'll see a couple of details uh, for, for this system. So um, from this perspective, uh, we, uh, we support two Power9 processors up to 20 cores per processor with SMT4. So you can have 160 hyper-thread cores, um, up to two terabytes of memory in the system. Um, uh, and um, in addition, we do support 170 gigabytes a second per socket. So we have still that, high, that huge bandwidth per socket uh, via eight DDR channels. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to every CPU. And in addition, because we know that the inference is about a balance between the power consumption, the GPUs, and what do you want to achieve on the inference side, the system is coming with 10 integrated I.O. slots, uh, PCI generation three and, and generation four, where you can hook right now um, up to uh, four, sorry, six uh, NVIDIA T4 GPUs, uh, PCI generation three, and we are looking to bring the support uh, this year for eight NVIDIA uh, T4 uh, GPUs in the same system. And we are looking as well to add additional accelerators like FPGAs and ASICs uh, into the platform. So you can have specialized work uh, workloads for specialized cases and you, you don't just rely only on one typically accelerator, you can have various things. Um, so that is something like, you know, it's highlighting somehow uh, the way uh, um, that the platform uh, is, uh, is supported right now. From the operating system perspective, we do support Red Hat 7.6 Alt. Uh, we're going to in include in the future the upcoming Red Hat 8.1, uh, I believe, or and Ubuntu. But again, it's the same open power platform, the same similar the one we use it for training or for high performance computing simulations based on the um, uh, open BMC standards. Uh, and for the, the ones that the, 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 you don't know here, we do support the management and, and via the, uh, an ARM uh, processor, which is as a, on, the base, uh, on the BMC, we support the open BMC uh, open um, software uh, Linux distribution to control the system. So you can even come up with your own uh, uh, innovation on top of it. Now, this is not enough. You need to look as well from the next generation software stack, how the users, they will consume this, especially when you have, you know, TensorFlow versions coming up at every two, three months, uh, Python versions, libraries. It's not really un common for HPC workloads or for HPC clusters to manage so huge dynamic of the software. So when you consider that, you have to understand, you know, the data sources that you're going to handle, because if you have data sets, for example, you use ImageNet to train, pre-train your networks, that comes with 1.5 millions of images in just 600 gigabytes of, of the data sets, only for training and another 800,000 for testing. And the question is how you manage your, your storage, how you can configure your storage from that perspective to support that from the file systems perspective. And this those number of uh, millions of uh, 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 files from the metadata perspective. And then you can you know, extrapolate that to other kind of data sets. And then neural networks, you have to understand how those are deployed and then how those are training consume and uh, obviously the impact on the computational side. So um, from the software stack, uh, always what we introduce for AI is those machine learning and deep learning libraries and frameworks. 
we understand we introduce uh, APIs for inference to consume them uh, in, in a cluster like this and to wrap them up into a microservice applications uh, to interact with external services and uh, uh, HPC uh, applications. And then we need to have also this governance AI, you know, fairness, explainable AI, model health accuracy, um, where we have um, created a lot of things around in the last two years. Now, from this perspective, in the in the sake of time, I will uh, show you right now the Watson Machine Learning Community Edition. This is a software we, uh, we ship with every system we have, but can be consumed on x86 as well. Um, and what we have done is that we have a collection of uh, frameworks and libraries, starting with TensorFlow, with all the estimators, probability serving. Uh, we do support 2.1 right now in the latest version and 1.15. Uh, we have PyTorch, Apex to, ex to use uh, the GPUs on the systems efficiently with a PyTorch, which is the NVIDIA implementation uh, of PyTorch for mixed precision. Um, we, do sub uh, we do include all the libraries needed, for example, Magma to accelerate the math for the PyTorch on the GPUs. Um, and then uh, we come up with our solutions for machine learning like SnapML, uh, Dusk. Rapids, everything are coming via Conda channel. So you can have them by just installing, uh, by doing the single command Conda install Power AI, and you will grab all this software together via Conda channel. What we do here, because there are huge dependencies between those frameworks and the libraries and nickel drivers for scaling and uh, the, the primitives for that, we ship as well the CUDA uh, and those drivers together with those frameworks. So when you decide to install them, we bring them as additional Python packages into a user profile. And therefore, whenever you, and we actually create versions at every three months, we have a new version, we have even uh, early releases. So those are coming together. And that means of an HPC cluster, we'll just have to maintain to the latest uh, GPU driver. They don't have to install the newer CUDA drivers because we ship them together with our platform. And whenever you, a user will create a virtual environment and will just consume the TensorFlow, we'll actually point to the Nickel or the Kudian drivers who are shipping with the WMLC together. And that is a major improvement when you really want to consume all those things. Um, and um, I, I have here an example when you try to extend that, right, from training to the inference. Uh, so training, you'll tend to tend on TensorFlow or in PyTorch. Uh, you may use, for example, uh, Rapid AI to, you know, just process the data much faster. Um, but at a certain point, you will uh, you'll, you'll, you'll train your network. You may save your network in the Open Neural Network Exchange, for example, and, and then say, yeah, I have my neural network. And now I want to put that as an inference process to be consumed, um, like I mentioned in the beginning. And therefore, in that particular case, you need to go to the inference platform and execute them with the same software stack we have, with no changes there. Um, and one of the default choices which is out there is just to use, for example, TensorFlow Serving Server, which just, you know, it, it's supporting TensorRT, it's supporting Open Neural, Net, uh, open neural Network Exchange format, so you can even use uh, models from PyTorch if you export them from, to uh, Open Neural Network Exchange format. And you can consume them in just a couple of minutes by exposing, requesting a node uh, for a specific number of hours, uh, or even if you want a node in a, uh, in a kind of interactive fashion. And immediately you can, you can start either by using a Docker container, uh, those uh, APIs, you can have them by exposing the, the model you have trained. Uh, and this is with the same software stack, same experience, PowerPC, all those systems, or x86. Um, again, for whenever you want to consume an inference, we see a demand for packaging everything into containers. And therefore, the same software you can find as a bare metal uh, or by using, you know, we ship them via the conduct channels, but you can consume them as a, as a Docker containers if the workload manager really manages those kind of containers. So we have them on the Docker Hub. You can go uh, download them from there. Uh, various versions, uh, various options, individual containers or all-in-one containers that you can even customize it. 
Um, another thing that we do is um, by moving more and more to Dalton Shift. So uh, we are actually right now uh, in a process uh, with some customer that they are using bare metal HPC solution and, and deep learning to move them entirely to OpenShift. And when you do that, you need to go and, and just consume those universal base images, which are very interesting, especially in HPC environment, because you can really trust the layers inside. One of the problem in high performance computing right now, when you want to consume uh, the, um, uh, containers is who is building those containers? What are the needed rights to give them those containers? How, I, how do I maintain the latest updates on the containers and so on? Um, and therefore, there are many, many challenges when you are trying to do that. But as we we're going to uh, include more and, and architecting more the OpenShift clusters for HPC and for AI, we're going to uh, move to universal base images uh, called UBIs. So if you go to uh, Red Hat Access Catalog right now, you can really you know, search for uh, what's a machine learning community edition and those containers are there. The recipes for, um, for um, deploying them are there and you can really uh, create various custom operators for your all your applications. They have to really build those kind of you know, solutions with modules and so on that they really need to be maintained. So um, I think um, from this perspective, it's something that we always try to understand in this rapid development where applications or frameworks or libraries are popping up at every couple of months, one month, two months, three months, and people, they want to consume the latest because they're offering various features and so on, which is a, putting a big stress on existing HPC administrators, clusters, and one of the things is how you can rethink the whole deployment of the system, the whole management of the system, how you can manage, uh, let's say, the workloads in order to not some other people, they should they are abusing the system, how you can manage the, con the containers that people are deploying, how you sh are, you, are you sure that whatever they are running is in your kernel or the base system and is not separated. Another thing that we are looking is to, for people that are using containers, is to have a con Docker container with the drivers and all the other contests that we need to, they will not need to have the drivers. So the CUDA drivers, and when you have them uh, deployed them, you can deploy them in pairs uh, with operators. So many, many things are happening right now, just to understand how at scale you can really sustain both words, HPC and AI in, in the easiest fashion with a user-centric view. Uh, because it's very simple to come up with a solution and say, hey, you know, you just have to use and consume the way those services they are. But the question is, are going to be successful or not when you do that? Um, so this is something that we uh, we are have done so, uh, lately, and we're going to see more announcements from IBM in the direction of the Bayesian optimizations, helping a lot of HPC uh, workloads um, across the world. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, I'm open for any questions if they are in audience. Um, if if not, I will be anyhow available after after that. Okay, thank you very much for for presentation. That's very very interesting to learn what is happening in the industrial in the leading labs of uh, major vendors, uh, and of course IBM is is uh, such a vendor. Uh, thank you for invitation as well and for uh, opportunity to present here, um, and as well thank you for our uh, uh, Open Power Leader uh, enabling us to be here today. Uh, Let's keep in touch and uh, yeah, I'm open for any other kind of discussions. Yeah, perhaps there are questions. Uh, are, yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience? I can't see anything. So perhaps I will ask you one question, sorry. Could you elaborate on those uh, interconnect? So how do you, inter if, 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 maybe you'll repeat it. How do you interconnect, uh, uh, what, what technology do you use to, to interconnect nodes? Uh, if, uh, across the nodes and also between nodes and uh, and the G GPU CPU. Mm -hmm. um, so for interconnecting the compute nodes, currently we do prefer infinite band, um, and the reason is especially when you do deep learning for complex models, 
we have seen measuring uh, even the power consumption a very big impact of uh, uh, latency. So when you have complex models, they will tend to uh, the, uh, the neural network model with many, many GPUs, uh, uh, that which is complex with many layers, it will tend to have a big and huge uh, exchange of parameters because your parameters will go to a couple of millions or maybe a billion of parameters. And when you train a neural network, that will really you know, be down to the network. So as long as the GPUs will be interconnected from the latency perspective, very, very fast, we're speaking about you know, microseconds uh, so we're speaking about here about RDMA uh, protocol over infinite band. Uh, the network will perform better when you are training. And right. therefore, lower power consumption and lower CO2. I just published a document about uh, implication of the uh, CO2 emissions when you train neural networks on those platforms. That's the first point. So we see as well the HDR uh, connectivity coming uh, and so on. And this is presenting somehow a challenge when you're looking on the containerized environment. So um, from the security perspective and so on, which is somehow manageable, manage, manageable right now with, uh, if you want to use Singularity, or for example, uh, if you package with uh, OpenShift. In the, in the node, on the node perspective, we see uh, one thread right now, we see people looking to adopt um, uh, PCI generation uh, five, generation six, on that kind of time frame, so the accelerators that should, should come, they should come with PCI generation five, uh, and a new interconnect um, that will make uh, the accelerators coherent with the system memory. So, um, from universal standpoint of view, we I personally see more uh, pe people moving away from NVLink interconnect between the CPU and the GPU. Okay, thank you. We have one question here uh, from Benson. Yeah. Can you can you see it, Florian? Uh, one second to stop the sharing this. Uh, no, I cannot see it. Um, okay, so I can read the question. Are yeah. you going to add accelerators from other vendors than NVIDIA? Uh, the answer is yes. We're going to add accelerators from uh, um, which are FPGAs and, and ASICs um, starting from this year. And the reason is because we see demands for other kind of workloads, especially in HPC, where people, they, they want to see other kind of uh, things and for inference perspective. So when you are looking for inference perspective, there are uh, some particular use cases where uh, FPGAs are performing much better. So, uh, yes, we are looking to bring that as new capabilities in our AC922 system.